This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon, everybody, and a very good afternoon on this Sunday, coming to you live from the Mara Triangle in Kenya. My name is Steve, joined by Big James on camera, and it is a very blustery and cool afternoon, although it is 26 degrees Celsius, 79 degrees Fahrenheit. There is a big storm brewing from behind us, but we've managed to find two big male lions cuddled together here. We don't quite know who they are just yet. I'm hoping some of you out there will be able to give us some identification if you know who these two pretty boys are. Don't forget you can interact with us live on hashtag Safari Live or throw in your comments or questions on the YouTube chat stream. We came a little bit further sort of south uh, to areas that are a little less sort of inundated by the rainfall. Uh, the ground is much harder here. We did make our way past sort of the hyena den area and the ground is still saturated with the previous few days rain. So thankfully we've managed to find these two beautiful boys who were sleeping under a very nice fig tree and they have now moved out and they've been sniffing and smelling the wind that's coming from this side and maybe we can still see them they've been having a little look at these two ground hornbills over here that have walked with about maybe 60 70 yards within reach of the lions but the lions have had a look and they've thought about it but they haven't moved haven't moved at all and I've tried to sneak up on ground hornbills before and although the name ground hornbill is their name they do fly quite well and if you get within 30 40 yards of them they will take off and fly away and that will be the end of it and many times I've actually seen them just flying off big black bodies with white tips on the wing enormous wingspan but the largest cooperative breeding birds that we know of but back to the gorgeous boys that everyone's commenting on how gorgeous they are the guy on the right has got a number of sort of wounds on his left hand side of his face which he's not showing us at the moment but aren't they gorgeous a nice bl blonde mane on the right see there's not any darkness in the manes here now a lot of people always talk about dark mane lions and sometimes you get blonde males and it's all really a genetic thing that's inherited from dad but anyway good news down in South Africa Tristan has been on the search and has found a cat already let's go and see which one we have indeed and as you can see we've got the peering eyes of the old Duke Tingana who's having a little nap on top of a termite mound he hasn't moved too far from where he was left last night and is now just taking it very easy kind of gazing around there's some impalas that were around just now that he was kind of watching and other than that he's just been fairly kind of chilled I think eventually he will go hunting this afternoon it's just gonna take a little bit of time that's for sure but it is very very good way kind of to start our day well at least I think so anyway my name is Tristan as Steve mentioned and on camera I've got Senzo this afternoon very warm welcome to South Africa the skies have cleared somewhat since this morning and it is a much prettier afternoon than it was this morning and so we've ditched the roofs and everything is much drier which is very nice and obviously Tingana is posing as well as well as we could ever ask for that's for sure he's kind of really sort of found a nice termite mound to be able to sit and just watch what's going on very 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 cool to kind of see that he's hung around i was hoping that we'd find him today i was a bit worried yesterday because when we left him his general direction was north <coughs> towards before the cut line so i didn't think that we would find him today but at the end of the day we got lucky and like i say he came out and he's actually headed more south this afternoon than anything else and then eventually found this beautiful termite mount to sit and doesn't he look ever so regal on top there like that and he's kind of he has obviously aged a little bit but i think he looks still looks in fine form considering how old he actually is i think he's looking really really good um haven't seen too much of that lump today it's still there a little bit but nothing um too bad uh, he'll be fine i mean last night by the time he started walking properly he wasn't limping at all he was sort of ambling around like he normally does very exciting way to start though isn't it well, i think so anyway right 
Well, we're going to sit with Tingana for the whole of the afternoon. We certainly won't be going anywhere. And so while we sit with him and see if he's going to make a move, let's send you across to Trishala so she can see, tell you what she's planning for the afternoon. Yes, well, that's really so lucky that we've got Tingana again today. It's always nice to have a leopard on drive, but I have something Tingana would much like to eat, I think. And those are two little baby kudus. How cute is that? I think it's spectacular. Well, my name is Trishala and I've got Craig on camera with me and we're going to be looking for all sorts of interesting things in the bush today. Starting, of course, with kudu and, you know, we've started with a leopard as well, so that's pretty awesome, I think. Oh, and there's a larger kudu up on this side. There's possibly mum over to my right. Just excuse my head there. And there were also a few impala that were rutting behind him or displaying a little bit. But as soon as he knew I wanted to put him on camera, he bounded off as they do. Even this, <laughs> even this female kudu doesn't feel like showing us her face. There she goes, eating away. It's actually quite a nice temperature out here today. It's about 28 degrees Celsius or 82 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's very nice and mild, at least for me. So there's lots of these browsers out and they're all having a bit of a snack. The leaves on trees are still a little bit juicier than the grass is at the moment. So you'll find that mixed feeders like the impalas will be eating a lot more of those leaves and then trying to get the nice juicy bits at the bottom of the grasses out too much like this little guy anyway i'm going to move on and we're going to have a look in the west as usual for any sign of another leopard in the meantime let me send you up to david in the masai mara Hello, hello, and uh, jumbo, jumbo, everyone. And yes, uh, Trishala, you need to keep moving, and hopefully you are going to get maybe Talamba. Well, the weather here is fantastic, wonderful weather. And where we are, we got some glorious landscape left right from where we are. And welcome to this part of the Masai Mara. Steve is on the other side. My name is David, and on camera is Archie. Archie, thank you very much. We just want to show you the kind of landscape we got and the weather that we have here that's just breathless you know we haven't seen any animals yet but that is the all always carpent and this should tell you i am already in the sausage republic great temperatures as steve must have told you earlier see the clouds as yet we do not see any cloud that should worry me and archie in terms of rain so far i would say so good I'm only getting a few bites here and there from the scissor flies. And I'm sure you all know scissor flies sometimes will cause what you call sleeping sickness. I would hate to kill any one of them, but if you get bitten by a scissor fly, it is so, so painful. It's just like a syringe, you know, being thrown in your flesh. See those clouds there? Those ones do not worry me. And many times you hear me and Steve or Pat and Lauren talking of the Mara Triangle is because of that escarpment there. Those clouds for me look fine unless they darken much later. Well, I'm sure Trish and Steve already told you to keep talking to us, engage us as much as you can. Janet, you say this is good, yes. So what I need to get for you, Janet, is to get to the sausages themselves because I am already in that particular territory and that is my very main plan uh, this afternoon, Janet. So stay tuned, do not go anywhere because chances are we might get them today. So Archie, don't show me much darker clouds. Don't put any worries in me. And I want to move on. But in the meantime, let's go back to the other side of the Mara with Vov with his lions.
Good job and good luck, Gigi. I hope you do manage to find the sausages. And good news from our side, the storm seems to be blowing in the other direction. But we scanned with our binoculars and you see the tree line at the back there. Wait for it. Three, two, one. One, there's two lioness there, and I saw already two little ones. So we're going to go a bit closer now, and let's go and see who they are. We are in the area where I have spent time with the Salt Lake Pride, so I've got an assumption that it might be them. But who these two big males are, I'm really asking your guys' help out there. Can you tell me who these male lions are? That'd be wonderful. But let's go see if we can have a look a little bit closer at some cuteness. Would you like that? Kelsix, the Kitcher boys are, I've seen them before. They've got a little bit dark in the mane and they are, they normally are much closer to the escarpment, closer towards Kitcher itself. And we're 30 kilometers, 15 odd miles maybe from there. So I'm not going to guess it's them. I do know those boys. I have spent time with them before. I do not know these two. So I, I doubt it's them. Um, if anything, I'd, there we go, there's a little young, oh, is that a youngster? Or is that an adult? It's hard to say from this distance. Here's a couple youngsters, one on the left and one on the right. So these are probably dad. One, oh, there's another lioness on the left. There's at least three youngsters. Well, let's go and have a look, shall we? Let's go find out exactly who these individuals are, and uh, then we can get a little bit closer. How does that sound? I'm happy if you're happy. Let's just get it to low range. Don't worry, boys. We'll be right back for you here if you do decide to get up and move. But definitely not, um, definitely not the um, the Kitra boys. That's for sure, and not the Eldonia Pikes because I know those two males. So we're just going to go straight over here. And who is this going to be? I'm thinking Salt Lake Pride. I haven't seen them in some time, but then I haven't been around, have I? It's a bit bumpy. Oh! Beck! Beck, um, you're saying something that I was almost getting to the assumption of as well. Beck's saying it could be the two young sausage tree pride males that were around with Kapuli. That I was having that thought for a moment, but I really don't know them well enough. I didn't spend enough time with them, um, but definitely we could be in the right area because they would have displaced themselves. I've seen Kapuli in this area before, uh, just up there against that main road. He was mating with a female, possibly one of these females, in fact, by the size of these cubs. Okay, it's getting very bumpy here. Oh, there's one, two, three. I've got three cubs already. Sorry, it's very rocky here. Four cubs, three lioness. Hold on, everybody. A little bit bumpy. Oopsie. Basalt rocks. We're going to stop right there. Let me just roll back off of the uh, off of the rock. Here we go. These little cuties here. Yeah, I thought I had a fourth one. There's two. There's one in the grass to the left of us. He's trying to hide. Hello, youngsters. They're about four months old. These cubs. Four, for maybe five months. By the size. And I saw that male lion mating with one of the, I think it was one of the Salt Lake Pride females. It is difficult, I must tell you, everybody. <laughs> James, the two youngsters are playing just on the left. There's a little bit of, a little bit of lion play happening. Um, so it is difficult to identify lions. It really is. It takes a lot of identification, a lot of photos, a lot of ID kits to be able to really get your head around them. Sometimes local knowledge is, is very, very important. And obviously you viewers at home have got your ability to, <laughs> hello, <laughs> to get your screenshots and to get all your information out for us and send them through. Unfortunately, when I am in, our vehicle doesn't receive any Wi-Fi. So I'm not able to even check my ID kits. So I'm hoping some of you out there, well, we're looking at the cubs first of all. And because they're so cute, we will focus on the females a little bit once they put their heads up and show us a little bit more action than the cubs are doing. And then we'll be able to hopefully get an idea of them. But it makes sort of sense that they're the Salt Lake Pride, but I really am not going to stake my life on it right now. So far, three adults and three cubs. I thought I saw a fourth one, but that might have been a rock. 
They do blend in so wonderfully well with their surroundings, don't they? And here we are, very blessed. Look at this office, look at this view for the day. Lions and the Mara over the backdrop. Look at that, isn't that just a marvelous scene? Last time I was here, that scene was littered with thousands, hundreds of thousands of wildebeest. And on our way in here, we did pass the three very grumpy looking buffalo. So maybe these lions, including the two big males behind us, will decide to catch one of them for some food. Who knows, when it's windy like this, you often get lions getting up and moving. Well, anyway, don't worry, folks, we will be staying right here where the action is. In the meantime, good news in South Africa, James is on drive, and he would like to say good afternoon. Well, we do not have any action on the yet. Good afternoon and welcome to the Sunset Safari here on a Sunday, the tw 28th of April, 19, no, not 1919, uh, it is 2019. My name is James Henry, on camera today, Sebastian Rombi, the greatest French Gabonese Air Force pilot in history, and this, of course, his little friend, Marvin. Is that what we called her? I think so. Anyway, uh, we'll be flying Marvin around the place, hopefully helping us find Tlalamba or Tandi. That is why we've come into this area. So we're sitting here at, or we're not sitting, we're driving along Central Road. And that is because we had tracks of a female leopard here today, this morning, during that rather pleasant rainfall for those of us who weren't actually out in it. Ben had some rain out here um, and he had the tracks. And I think that you'll find that Sebastian will not in fact, agree that the rain was pleasant. Is that correct? No, not really. Not really. Yeah, no. Fair enough. Sebastian oh, okay. insisted that we delay the morning meeting by 15 minutes so that he could go and shower himself and put some warm clothes on. And have a hot chocolate. And many thanks to all of you who said you missed me so much. I missed you too. Righty. The first thing we're going to do is stop next to this vast vulture which doesn't seem to be on the ground at the kill site oh, this is very interesting oh it's a leopard faced vulture oh that's beautiful look at that oh well done that's the leopard faced vulture everybody very large vulture and dominator of carcasses. And then the other bird that was up there was a tawny eagle. Now, this area was where there was a dead stenbok yesterday that Tristan found and we investigated a little bit later on. And we didn't actually manage to find anything other than the carcass. But the fact that these birds were not on the ground tells me that maybe, just maybe, we're going to be lucky. And there is actually a predator there. There we have got a batelier, juvenile on the right and left. Two teenagers having a Sunday afternoon tryst. <laughs> Remember those days, Sebastian, mm -hmm. when you were a teenager having a Sunday afternoon tryst? Hopefully not over a rotting carcass. And hopefully you didn't behave like that one on the left there, in front of your beloved. Good. Very sort of gentle autumnal weather today. Rustling dry leaves, gentle breeze, pleasant smells. All right, we're going to go and see if there's something next to this little carcass. While we do that, let us go back to uh, Tristan Dix and the laziest leopard in all the world. I can agree with James. It's a very pleasant smell in the air after the rain. Although I think it's a little bit too little too late. I don't think we're going to see too much green grass kind of coming of it. I'm pretty sure uh, most of the grass has already lost its lignin and is starting to fall over. And with the cooler temperatures and shorter days, the uh, rain that we've gotten now is really not going to do too much. And it wasn't enough to really fill up dams. Um, as soon as we get a little bit of hot weather, it will dry up most of what we had. But at least it's something. It's better than... In no rain, that's for sure. As you can see, Tingana, who's 
kind of been quite aware. He's been watching and looking around quite a bit, but he's just sort of popped his head down now to have a bit of a nap. And I think he's going to do much like what he did yesterday afternoon, which is probably sleep for quite a while. And then as soon as it starts to get dark, then he'll start to get moving and start to go looking for any semblance of food. It was interesting watching him last night. He would walk a little bit, stop, walk a bit, stop, and eventually he found a series of holes, much like he did a few weekends ago, and just sat up there and kind of watched towards the holes. And he obviously spent most of the day or well, night there last night because where he was found this afternoon was very, very close to where that was. So, um, his, obviously his strategy at the moment is just to do that, is to find certain holes in the ground that he potentially thinks there's maybe aardvarks or warthogs, um, and then just sit and wait in the hope that something comes out that he can then surprise it and grab it. Um, it doesn't seem to have been too successful of late because we haven't found him on any kills, um, particularly things like big aardvarks or um, warthogs, but you never know. There must be some method to his madness, and it's probably easier than going around and trying to chase things like impalas and Steiker and Steenbock and the likes so that's his kind of tactic at the moment and I'm interested to see what he kind of gets up to this evening and which way he's going to go um, you know he's spent the better part of almost two days now really hanging around this the dam area we're not too actually not too far from the dam and so it's very possible that he might decide to kind of get up and start moving and heading away from this area but we'll see how it goes um, we'll see what happens and where he heads off to you can see he's a bit of a celebrity today he's being photographed by many people um, and so he's a bit wide-eyed when the shutters go off but I'm pretty sure we're going to unfortunately have to make space for a whole bunch of people and rather do it now, early, before the TV show than later. So we'll probably go meandering about for a bit and then come back. And, and while we do that, let's send you across to Steve and see how he's getting on with his lines. Well, good luck there, Tristan. Hopefully the Duke gets up and does something this evening. And we're not going anywhere. We're in a prime position now. And still only managed to identify three cubs, but then a fourth lioness suddenly showed her head. See if you can spot her there. See if you can spot her, everybody. Now imagine you're walking through the long grass. Look at that. That would be quite frightening, wouldn't it? Now, the majority of the Mara at this stage is fooled or covered in grass like that, uh, where it wasn't burnt. And that is the favourite hunting ground of the lions up here in the Mara. Tawny cats using the stealth of the long grass, the camouflage. For now, they're just using it for a nice little pillow. Francesca, since I've been here, I haven't heard any information about Scarface or the Musketeers. James, do you have any info on them? No. no? Haven't haven't heard anything. Um, it's been pretty slow going of late with with cats due to the fact that most areas are quite inaccessible because of the rainfall. So we're in an area that seems to be relatively dry today, um, but there's been no report of him. Who knows? He might have gone further south. There's a number of WhatsApp groups giving information on the sightings and what's being seen, and it's been a very very quiet. There we go. <laughs> see, mum on the right is becoming a jungle gym. Let's see if this one's going to join in the charades. So you can get a bit of a better look at these lionesses' faces now. None of them have stood up yet. I mean, the sausage tree pride could even come this far if they have been moving. Um, if those two males are the old sausage tree pride males, then th there wouldn't be any risk, you'd think to the cubs, but I haven't managed to get any identificating, identification features of yet to tell me if any one of these is indeed one of those. So for now, we have got a pride of lions playing in the long grass, cuteness overload.
Hello, Lindsay. Yes, it does. Well, where we are right up on this sort of rocky area, it's very, very rocky. Um, it doesn't have the same soil type that you'll find down in the valleys. So the soil is very shallow here. You probably noticed on my way in it was very bumpy. Uh, but this entire valley, this entire area left and right of us was burnt last year. So there was enormous fires put through here. And that would have eliminated a lot of the old grass that would have grown up on these hills. Um, there, where you can see the lionesses walking, a sort of a rocky alcove that would have protected that grass from the fire that raged through here. That's how the trees also are protected in these little rocky areas because the fire is often sort of kept away from very rocky areas. It's kind of like a, a retreat for certain trees. You'll see them often out in very fire prone environments that fire doesn't get up. But this entire valley that we see on our left here, James can show you the entire valley there, was burnt last year and uh, we had so many wildebeest in this area and it was a really good area to come in to sort of experience and to drive through. Unfortunately, if we go a little bit more left from where we are now, a little bit more down in the valley, we don't get any signals. So we're quite happy where we are right up on top of this sort of ridge line uh, that we do have signal. And we have lionesses with cubs. And I think the two males are still sleeping behind us. This is the best time of day. The temperatures have cooled quite substantially because of the storm that is all around. There's little pockets of rain falling in many, many different areas. And you can see by the wind how much it would cool everything down as well. When initially we found those two males, we couldn't see these lionesses, although I did scan all around. They were probably hidden in flat in the grass, or maybe they were a little bit more covered in there by the bushes, as the male lions were both sleeping in the shade. And then as the wind picked up, they went and lay in the sun because obviously the wind kept them a little bit cooler. Since then, I put my jacket on. So it definitely is a much cooler afternoon than the 26 degrees Celsius implies. Okay, everybody. Well, if any of you have any ID on the lines we've managed to show you so far, please send them through on Twitter. Hashtag Safari Live. And in the meantime, let's go back down to Trishala in Juma for an update. Uh, well, I'm also looking for some sort of cat. I'm in the west and I'm scouring through and I haven't had much luck yet, but I am looking for tracks and looking on the sides as well. The problem is because of the heavy rain this morning, and you can see how different it is if you watch the sunrise safari, how different the weather is right now. It's bright and sunny. And what's that's done is the water has wet the ground and then dried the ground, so it's actually quite hard. So unless an animal is walking with quite some force or you're lucky in a certain part let's have a look at these guys certain type of soil then you're lucky enough to see those tracks so that's what i am looking for at the moment and i'm checking out the west it's been a while since we've seen shidulu or hukumuri so i would really really like to find them i'm sure these warthogs would prefer that i didn't find hukumuru <laughs> hukumuri anywhere close to them. He utterly loves Warthog. Maybe I should actually follow them before I know it, Hukumuri might come out. Oh, they've seen something. Oh no. Possibly just better food. <laughs> Looks like they have seen something, actually. One looked off into the distance. What have you seen? We move a little bit forward so we can have a better look. They didn't look like they were looking very seriously in that direction. But you've got to check these things out because you never know. Ah, they were looking at a group of impala. Kimberly, you think warthogs are so cute? I think they're so cute too. Their little piglets are so adorable. 
So it looks like they were just watching these impala that were there. So nothing too exciting, but obviously got their attention. So this is a bachelor group of males. Oh, they were probably sparring amongst themselves and having a bit of a practice rut, waiting their turn. Got the attention of these warthogs that were eating nearby. Hey, Impalas, are you happy that now during your season you're getting a lot more publicity? You're, being, you're getting famous? I've got the one guy in the middle who's chewing away. I love watching them when they are chewing their cud. As you see them swallow it and then they throw up another little ball. Oh, how was that little kick? Well, I'm glad to see that these guys are taking care of themselves. You can see the one is cleaning. So often during the rutting season, you'll find males that are... Ooh, ooh that looks like a face-off. Oh, there we go. I love how the ruminating one at the back doesn't care at all. <laughs> this looks like when you're trying to wrestle with your mates and you say, okay, okay, hold me, hold me here. No, this hurts, hold me here. Being very, very careful, but still trying to have a go at fighting with each other. <laughs> that one in the bank doesn't care at all. He's just trying to eat his, his cud. So this little group are obviously males who have not yet found themselves territory. Instead, they've banded together. Oh, how was that yawn? <laughs> now, that was actually a really nice display of how the herbivore jaw can't really open in the same way ours, and, ours can, as in up and down. In the same way, a carnivore's jaw can't move from side to side. And you'll find here, when he yawned, you could see it kind of had to do a big circle because it can't just simply go up and down like our jaws can with a hinge. Instead, it's got to be on a horizontal plane from side to side. I've never actually seen them yawn like that. And it's the first time I saw a really nice example of that jaw movement. <laughs> and back to feeding and cleaning. Gremlins are getting me these days and I hate it, but I will defeat them. In the meantime, let me send you over to James, who is not having the issues I am. For the more experienced of you, you're probably looking at me saying, oh, surely he's not going to explain the magic worry to us yet again. And I am not. I... I'm in fact going to use this magic worry to punish myself. Why, you might ask? Well, I misidentified that vulture, of, and it was, of course, a white-backed vulture. Thank you, James Richard. And so now it falls upon me to punish myself severely. a white-headed vulture, correct, yes. What did I say? White back. <laughs> no blood. 
And I'll show you the difference between the two. Three, in fact, now that I've made two mistakes. <sighs> Hello, Janice. You say I'm still a guide. No, I'm not. I'm a naturalist. Please play my strap, Kirsten. Right. Now, what we had, of course, was the white-headed vulture over there. It looks, at first glance, vaguely similar to a leopard-faced, but really an inexcusable mistake from somebody who's been around here for as long as I have. And those are those two. And then the white-backed, of course, well, you all know that one. I didn't actually think it was a white-backed, I just mistook the white, you know, and then it was a slip of the tongue. There it is. Right, I feel quite exhausted after that. Mm. Self-flagellation. Obviously, if I'd had a spike to whip of some sort, I'd have used that. James Richard, you said it was a bit unnecessary. Well, that's very kind of you to say that it was unnecessary. I don't feel it was. I feel thoroughly embarrassed and... Um, I, was, I think I should. I think I should feel embarrassed, and I'm hoping that the severe pain I feel all over my body now is going to help me to remind me myself uh, not to make that mistake again. Good. Right, so we've come down here because we thought we heard some impala alarm calling. We checked out the carcass. It's exactly the same place as it was yesterday. I don't know why the birds aren't feeding on it. They definitely have been feeding on it, but now they've left it. We heard some alarm calling, but it seemed so far away. So we're, we've checked Chelapan, which is just north of us. We're now going towards Twin Dams. We haven't found any tracks, but we are certainly doing our best. Quite an effect of that, because it doesn't actually hurt that much. It looks much more painful than it probably was. <laughs> I believe the Brennans are now punishing me, so we'll go back across to Steve in the Marcy Mark. Well, James, if you punish yourself with a branch, I don't... <laughs> I wish I'd seen that. I'd like to go back and watch a replay. I'm sure all of you are going to be uploading into the Twitterverse some wonderful images of James beating himself. Maybe we need to do a little GIF, however you call it, a G-I-F, one of the little repetitive little images. Please, everybody, would you send one of them through? I need a little chuckle before I go to bed this evening. Yeah, Kirsty agrees. Yes, Kirsty Grease. Everybody, please see who can make the best one and send them through. <laughs> well, now, what's very interesting, and it's something we don't see with hyenas, and we do see with lions all the time, is the communal suckling. Uh, this lioness, who's been there in the same place the whole time, I noticed she had some suckle marks, um, but the two cubs, at least two of them, one was just playing, were suckling on the first lioness you saw them playing with, and now they've gone over to this one, and she's allowed them to suckle as well. It's one of the, the things that lionesses will do, uh, communal suckling, because they are generally related. Uh, well, for the most part, lionesses are always related and uh, generally also breed at a very similar time. You've seen the baby boom that's happened here. It's happened in the past. Lionesses are often synchronized breeding so as to maximize the number of cubs that will actually make it to adulthood. And they don't mind suckling each other's youngsters. It's my sister or my daughter's uh, cubs. Essentially, there's relations there, and it's that unselfish gene of it is my genetics going forward. So it's something we see in lions all the time, but we do not see it in hyenas. And, well, it's a little bit interesting, the dynamic there, isn't it? And, uh, well, one of those is a boy. I could tell that. He was getting quite, quite um, feisty with this lioness that's lying with her back to us. Snazzy, you want to know that why lions are compassionate while other cats are not? Well, lions are the only social cat that I can think of, the only one I believe, 
and they when they feed on a carcass there's a lot of aggression that takes place a lot of fighting um, it happens at this early stage as well if there's a third cub trying to suckle there's going to be competition for that milk so from an early age they learn to be competitive and they learn to be quite sort of aggressive with each other and that's how you need to survive as a lion but then after all the sort of the bloodshed or all of the the anger is gone or dissipates and there's a lot of love and a lot of compassion that is distributed between them and grooming and all that sort of thing because they do need to be cohesive imagine if you fought everyone every day you're not going to be a very good hunting unit are you if yes you punched me this morning you clawed the back of my head fine I'll kind of lick you you see it very very often with young males that are in a pride that in a beating up mum quite sort of aggressively at the, at the feeding zone and then later on that evening he comes back to mum and he kind of still sort of like licks her and goes I'm sorry I didn't mean to be so so dominant earlier I'm sorry I scratched you on the face and they need to be sort of social it is how they've evolved that's how they've probably turned the corner from what was the leopard and they've moved into these much larger predators who need to be a unit to take down much larger prey a lioness can be quite successful on her own <clears throat> excuse me but she is far successful in a pride and they're far more successful at rearing cubs in a pride than they are on their own here we go she looks like the oldest in the group the little cub sneaking up there let's see what it's going to do is it always naughty when cubs are moving around i'm going to scratch its head first a little bit of a lick there was lots of grooming going on as well each of the cubs that went to whatever lioness was there got a proper body lick all the parts were properly groomed so it seems like it's licking its lips as if it's possibly been suckling that might have been suckling on the lioness we've lost a visual of lying in the long grass there so it's possibly at least three of these lionesses are suckling currently so it, the cubs all look very much the same size if they are from the same litter or not they were probably conceived at a very similar age Hey Jessica, that's a great question. I mean, I've never physically known a lioness to say, or for them to go look at each other and kind of pull straws and go, who's got more milk? They, it's all about the lioness's need to eat. If she's got food, she, if she's hungry, I mean, she's going to go hunt. It is just the way it works. And if those cubs haven't suckled yet, uh, well, they'll have to wait until she gets back. Uh, but the whole cycle of it works is in that each lioness has the potential to stay behind at any given stage. You don't always see them all going off, and sometimes they do all go off, but then often you'll see them coming back like this to a communal sort of area. Maybe these cubs have been stashed in that little rocky area for the evening the lionesses are out maybe hunting i don't think they were successful if they were uh, it wasn't a very big meal that they had uh, but it means that any one of the lionesses can stay back if she has cubs at the time or at least is nearing having cubs because they start producing milk before uh, obviously they can before they uh, give birth so each of the lionesses is able to look after the cubs <laughs> there we go you can clearly see the spots on them now that one looks t slightly smaller than the other two but they are all very very similar in age the one in the middle being the young boy so far that I've identified we'll see if we can identify the other two everybody David is about seven or so kilometers south east west of us he's on the search for the sausage tree pride
You okay? All right. So anyhow, I think there could be something with my pump. So we just check what could be the problem. I just want to make sure. Okay, let's first take you to Trishala as we find out what could be your problem where we are. look at some of these leaves ah gremlins are all about i see well i'm really hoping they stop with me and that i've had enough of me but what i would really like to show you of course i'm still looking for the leopards and i was actually hoping maybe a lion or two or ten but unfortunately they still seem to be in the north in buffalsuk and not down here in juma Nevertheless, I will still be there right at the top. I'm almost completely in the north at the at the um, the border. So hopefully I'll check in there. If I see any tracks coming in, then I'll know that they pr probably might be on Juma, which would be excellent for us. But while I drive through, I'd like to show you some leaves that are changing color. This one is a nice example. Sinak, you'd like to know what I think is the cutest antelope in the bush? My favorite antelope in the bush are kudu. I love kudu. I think they're beautiful and handsome and the colors are spectacular. Just like the colors of these trees. Now the tops of all of these trees and are starting to kind of wilt and you'll see that they're all changing color. Now it doesn't really happen in the same way as it does in the Northern Hemisphere. And you get those whole deciduous forests that change color when autumn comes round. But here you can see that they're kind of dr uh, dried up and they've got that yellowy orange color to them. And almost all the trees around at the moment have these colors. And you'll notice that the one that you're looking at now, which is a combretum, gets nice and yellowy before it gets brown and falls off. Whereas the round leaf teak, which is just at the bottom of that combretum, there we go. You can see that there's still some green leaves and then it goes yellow and then red towards the bottom of your screen there you can see a few of the redder leaves and then it gets black of course as it falls so you can see that the seasons are most definitely changing and you'll see it a lot with the combretums as the color changes. It's a really pretty warm color. And there's also, also some marula trees that have been changing a pretty color as well. If I find one of them, I'll show it to you. Now, it's really interesting how that color works. So you know that chloropla uh, chlorophyll, filled with chloroplasts, create this green that we see in plants. And what happens is when this resources get scarce, it gets colder, drier, less nutrients around it stops nutrients going to certain leaves because now it's it's saving all its its energy and by doing that chlorophyll no longer gets maintained in those leaves and so what happens is the other pigments that are in the leaves get a chance now to be seen so that's what happens when we see the reds and yellows of trees that are changing with the seasons is actually the green pigments been stripped away and now we can see the other pigments in the leaves. So I think it's quite interesting. We only think of it as, oh, it's dry, so it must have just dried, which I suppose is not incorrect, but it's not as if that is just a result from of dryness. It's a result first of those pigments being taken away. I am looking into the sunset at the moment. Please get off me. There we go. It's nothing like a bit of a fly type stingy thing. All I know is it stung me or it butt me or whatever it did, but it's itchy now. <laughs> oh, I'm going to itch you. Now it's going to be coming. Now you'll feel it. But in the meantime, I didn't quite get it. Well, we've unfortunately had to leave Tingana because it's just, just chaos there and 
my blood pressure was starting to rise and so I thought better of staying there before I got irritated and upset with somebody um, and so we're now waiting for all of them to cycle through so that we can get back to Tingana just now. But as we kind of left, we bumped into a terrapin that must be very lost at this stage because we are now kind of in the middle of the Mulwati, nowhere near any water, to be honest. And this poor guy is kind of walking around now. Aubrey's calling me again. Go ahead, Orbs. I swear I hear... Okay, copy that, Orbs. Um, whereabouts is he now? Okay, copy, thank you. Right, so Aubrey's just telling me what's happening with Tingani. He's keeping me updated because he's worried that they might lose him and then we won't be able to find him. Now, why I've stopped here and I'm looking with my binoculars is to our right-hand side at the moment, I'll stop quickly, just, sorry, Sens, I know it's a terrible angle that I've stopped you at. Um, but in underneath that tree there, so over that area, is a den site that Tandy used for Tlalamba quite a lot. Um, so I just stopped just in the off chance that maybe she's milling about in there and just quickly had a little look. Um, at the moment it's one of those kind of games where it's worth just stopping at every kind of potential den site that we know Tundi liked to use and just check. I mean, you never know. Maybe we get lucky and she's sitting inside, but no one home today, so definitely not giving birth there. Um, and this is the game that's going to have to be played, is just kind of checking and hoping and eventually we'll maybe find her. But. I wouldn't be surprised she's gone on to Torchwood and I wouldn't be surprised she actually gives birth on Torchwood, to be honest with you. But we'll see how it goes. Let's just keep sort of hoping that she stays our side. The other den size she used to use is on my left hand side actually. There's that fallen over tree there. Um, so some of you will probably recognize that from Clalumba. That's where she used to kind of <coughs> keep Clalumba quite a bit. So one was this side and the other one was that side. Um, and they used to play on that log quite a bit. So she's not anywhere to be seen in this area. Now Aubrey's talking to me. Yeah, FM Orbs. I'm um, basically, remember where Tundi's old Kaya was? So just trying to find out where Tingana's heading. I'm just listening now. All right, so Aubrey's telling me that he's heading straight towards us at the moment. All right, copy that, Orbs. Yeah, I'm just on the southern side of that little um, dip, well, that little drainage line. So I'll try and head roughly towards central, see if I can pick up your audio. All right, so we're gonna try and see if we can find Aubrey. Aubrey is very kindly gonna make a space for us um, so that we can carry on following Tingana. Um, and so while I try and find Tingana and Aubrey in this mess, uh, let's send you back across to Steve. Good luck, Tristan. I'm no doubt the Juma guides will allow you in there so you can keep up with the Duke of Juma who always materializes just in time for TV, doesn't he? He is a superstar. Oh, there's lightning in the horizon. Yeah, the mountains in the background there, that is the, um, the uh, Olololo mountain range, you can see. And the lightning is striking on that escarpment. So I wanted to show you my book here, just so you get a bit of a reference of where we are. I'm just going to put it on the dashboard here and get an idea. We're over here. This obviously is a map of the Mara Triangle. Here is where we are. The Tanzania border is this line along the bottom. Quite easy. And uh, so David and the Sausage Tree Pride is kind of in this area. That's where they kind of been hanging out. But it's not that far. It's about seven kilometers. But to Kichwa Airstrip, I've got to go up all the way up here and then if I turn the page just to keep going keeps going and then it starts here again and keep going and here is where Kitchen airstrip is all the way over here so the Kitchen males this is where I've seen them spending time if they've come further south than that I'm not sure but we're in a very very different area from that altogether so I'm just going to go back to the first page 
you can get an idea of where we are. So my first initial guess of about 15 kilometers, we're about 20 kilometers from from Kichwa, which is not an enormous amount of distance for lions to travel, um, but I doubt those males would have come down this further south. The females seem to be a bit more fluid in their movements, um, but the lion dynamics out here is also quite crazy. Last time I said the lions were nowhere near any of the territories anyone was saying they were, and now I'm back again, and well, this is the first lions I've managed to find, apart from a, a pair of lionesses that were walking up our road towards our camp last night and right in front or next to FC a lioness back last night while Steph was brushing his teeth just outside his tent about seven eight meters from his tent a lioness killed a water buck Sammy Jane you want to know how lionesses don't injure their teeth when they are fighting or when they are killing well how does anyone not injure their teeth um, you try not bite things that are too hard. Um, lions will use their teeth for ripping flesh uh, and with the side of their teeth for breaking the, the bones that they possibly can break. Um, but invariably the lioness's teeth will break after a period of time and that's something you often notice in leopards and lions with age. You'll start seeing the canines are worn down. They might even break teeth and lose them altogether. They don't have the benefit of a dentist like we do back home. Uh, once their teeth are gone, Pretty much that's it. So that's something that quite often is seen in sort of an old lioness or more, should I say, in a leopard. A leopard that gets very old, the teeth wear down, it gets very, very weak, it struggles to catch food, and they become quite dangerous. And that is the re reports down in South Africa of anyone who's been caught or attacked by a leopard. It's generally a, a sick, injured individual that has probably broken or lost some teeth and has struggled to hunt. So when they're in a pride like this, they're still pretty good at hunting and they aren't able to break those really big bones that the uh, hyenas then are capable of, of with the, probably the strongest teeth in the animal kingdom. Crocodiles are able to replace their teeth, their teeth that snap shut all the time. Once one of those teeth break or fall out, they've got another cone of a tooth busy growing right underneath the first one, which is quite incredible. It's obviously due to the fact that their teeth are quite brutally used during their life but lions the canines are very important for killing or delivering the final blow and the side carnassial shear for carving and tearing flesh anyway Trishala down in South Africa her search continues but she's managed to find herself a beautiful elephant I finally found what I've been looking for. It's not exactly the leopard, but I've been looking for these elephants too, and I'm so glad to see them. And we have a little one amongst them. Hello, little one. I think this might be a mum off to the left, slightly bigger female. And there's also a youngish male bringing up the rear. Cute cute little family oh I've missed them so much oh this one's got a kinky tail this is quite odd look at all of their tails actually note that tail and now note this female's tail and even the youngster's tail seems to have a bit of a kink. I wonder if it's something I've just never noticed or it's some sort of gene. Now that tiny one that you're looking at, you can see there's little tusks slightly poking through. So that tells me it's about three to four years old, maybe actually a little younger. Those, those little tusks are quite small I would say about three and it's quite a small group now you'll see this often in a herd they'll separate from each other to feed and other things and they'll often do this even though their home ranges are massive they'll move across move across them not always as a big group but sometimes in these smaller family groups
very sweet. I see they've been moving on to, to trees, much like all of the animals at the moment. The herbivores that are around seem to be moving about and eating from the trees a little more often as days go by. Hello. Oh, and they didn't even come to say hello, these ones. I love when elephants come close to the vehicle and want to just say hello to you. These ones are very relaxed. I can actually see there's one behind the one that you're looking at. I think it's the little one. And oh, there we go. Oh no, mom, we've moved right across your little one. I wanted to show them how it was using its trunk. No, she's going to show us instead. Highly dexterous and pulling off all those tasty bits from that. That looks like a russet bush willow that they're eating at the moment. It's quite remarkable the change you'll see as the, as the seasons change and the way that the animals' diet will change, their habits will change. I mean, it was just a few weeks ago and we were still seeing elephants mostly eating grass. I'm looking forward to seeing how their dung changes. I love looking through it and seeing the differences. Hello, little one. I suspect there may be others around, but not very, very close. I haven't seen too many elephant tracks around either. So I was actually surprised when I stumbled upon these three. I hope I'll be able to catch up with the rest with the rest of the herd if there are more around. I really hope there are. Anyway, let me keep on going. I've done my border patrol here a little bit. In the meantime, let me send you over to Tristan while I keep looking. Right. So we're still with Tingana. Well, we've rejoined Tingana, but he's heading to where we were looking just now. Um, and apparently some of you say that there was a leopard on a frame that we had just now of that fallen over log. Um, and so <laughs> he's kind of staring in that direction. I, I, I honestly did not see a leopard um, and neither did Senzo, which has got the sharpest eyes of all of us. But maybe it was just hidden there and I just missed it completely, which is going to be surprising. But the way Tingana's behaving, it's possible that there could be another leopard here, um, given that there was... Um, the way he's been sniffing and he's just stopped and stared and he's heading exactly, exactly to where we were framed up on that log just now where I was showing you that Tundi has another den, well, has had another den before. And so let's see how we go and see whether or not we get lucky here. Maybe there is another leopard. If it is another leopard, well, one, one wonders. Doesn't it? Now, James is. Uh, they, I think my ear is about to bleed with the amount of talking I've had to deal with today. Go ahead, James. Not James's fault. James is the first time I've heard him on the radio, so we don't blame James with this game. But everybody else has been shouting and carrying on, and there's been no decorum today, and there needs to be some lessons taught, I think. So I'm going to unleash James Henry on everybody at some point to teach them all about uh, having some manners on the radio. All right, so the log that I framed just now that you guys are saying there was another leopard is right here in front of us. It's just on this other side here. Um, and so let's see if Tingana heads there and another leopard jumps out. Well, then we'll know for sure, won't we? I'm hesitant to head too close and I'll tell you why. Because I don't want, if it is Tundi, I don't want to be that close to her. Now, Tingana's right here next to me. I'm just going to quickly jump down on top. Mm, smells like popcorn. The best smell when you're in the bush is the smell. I'm just going to jump down. Hold on, Sins. Because the log is just on our left-hand side here. Oh, 
How's that for a picture? Hello, boy. You're right above us. Isn't that cool? That's awesome. He's standing, I would say, maybe five meters from where I am at the moment. And he's, you know, he's heading straight to that log. Since let's just go forward a little bit. So he's heading across. I don't see a leopard, but maybe I'm wrong. No, he's walked right past it and he hasn't interacted with anyone. I don't see another leopard coming out. So Lou says she can't see anything in the shots, but that's the log apparently. There was another leopard at that log. I honestly did not see anything. Um, but, but it's possible, I suppose. I just don't want to lose Tingana. I'm going to just go up and around, back to where we were when we had that first shot. And try and see if we can get some sort of view of what's going on here. Is there any screenshots, Cursed, of, of this said leopard? And it's, or any sort of... But let's... All right, so I believe Kirst is saying she's looking on the replay. She can't see anything. So I don't know, maybe. So Tandy's just been found, but not here. So she's been found not far from where we are. Um, James, I think, is heading in that direction. There's Tingana's way off. If there was another leopard here, there's no way he would have gone as far. No, there's definitely no leopard there that I can see. No, all right, he's gone way too far. Um, and like I say, if there was another leopard, there's no way that other leopard wouldn't have noticed him or him notice the other leopard. The ability to smell and pick up scent is very, very, very good in these animals. And so there's no way, I'm afraid, if there was one that Tingana would have missed it. But anyway, we've caught up with Tingana now. He's mobile straight down um, Mulawati, which is not good for us because he's going to probably cross off this property rather quickly if he keeps up the pace that he's walking at the moment. Isn't this cool though? Driving down the Mulwati with a leopard. It's like that iconic thing when you come to Juma or if you ever in the sort of Savi Sands, you're always your thought is a leopard walking down a drainage line or a riverbed. So it's always so nice when you get into a place like this and you're able to kind of follow a leopard through. Now I've got to be a bit careful of our antenna through here. Let's just go this way a little bit. Ah, look at that. We managed to avoid the antenna completely. Good, we're going to keep up with Tingana. We're going to keep going. Hopefully James will get to Tundi in the meantime. And while we do all of that, let's send you across to David in the Mara with some ground. Tingana, well done. Don't go anywhere because I'm sure you got the right person with you, Tristan. I've spotted some hornbills from a distance, then they have taken off. And why I want to see that you can catch up with them, because the very rare hornbills are currently in Africa, and they're getting quite vulnerable. And every time I try to go close to them, they are moving. Are you happy there, actually, just try it? Let's see if we can capture them from here before they take off again. They're what we call the southern ground hornbill. How beautiful to see them. There are about four of them, and they live in bigger groups. Uh, you rarely see one. It will be two, three, four, sometimes up to ten. It's beautiful, I'm sure. I don't remember the last time Casty, who is directing the show, uh, saw uh, the southern ground hornbills. See how they blend in. They come in very well, rather. Uh, the contrast between the them and the green grass. All right, I didn't even realize Steve had two before. While Steve had two, I got four. And they could be picking anything, snails and uh, any other insect or beetles. You should just grab it and swallow it straight away. 
And if you look at their beaks carefully, it's like they don't close very well. They look like they're open-billed stalks. But they've got very powerful beaks. And I'm sure Steve might have mentioned that currently uh, these birds are quite vulnerable if you look at their li listing with the IUCN. And the main concern is loss of habitat. And then they take about three years or so for them to, you know, bring up a full uh, chicks to be independent and fully grown. Three is such a long time. That to me could be a female. Uh, the males have such a bigger and bright water uh, than the, yes, this male, I would guess. Thank you, Archie. And you see that sack below or at the base of the beak? It looks quite big, quite blown. And I would call that kind of a, a male display. Child of the universe, you'd like to know what exactly they do eat. Well, like most uh, birds of this age, we'll start maybe classifying what they eat, child of the universe, by looking at the beak. If you look at the beak, the beak is quite huge. It's like a chisel. And most birds will eat both, you know, they're both either carnivores and herbivores at the same time, or we could, we could call them omnivores. But child of the universe, I would say, the ground hornbills are more carnivores than anything else. They would eat any beetles they would catch. And I'll also tell you, they also eat tortoises. Can you believe that? And what they do when they grab a tortoise, they don't even wait to kill it. You know, tortoises are a bit slow. That beak is so powerful and they use it like a chisel and they open the shells of the, the tortoise <laughs> and, get, and they get the flesh from it. So basically, each other of the universe would say these birds are more carnivores than they would be herbivores. I don't, uh, I would guess they would also catch, you know, a, uh, get a fruit here or some seeds there once in a while, but mainly they are carnivores. Tortoises, snails, uh, beetles, grasshoppers, uh, cicadas if they'll get them, locusts if they'll get them. And now with the rains that we have with the Mara now, we got so many of these types of insects out trying also to feed. I mean, these insects being herbivores and they try to feed on the grass or blades of glass, grass or seeds, then these uh, hornbills will take the advantage. We also see they are corporate breeders. So should you see four, five, six of them, there could be ma mainly a couple, a male and a female, and then either cousins who will be helping to raise the chicks. Huge birds, they do fly as much as they look very big. And they will always nest. What do you catch there? They'll nest on very huge uh, solid trees, on holes of solid trees. I'm sure they are having a party there. Not sure exactly what they're feeding on. When you look at the base of that red water for the females, they have a bit of bluish, pinkish. Ian, good question. And you ask, do they eat snakes? Ian, 100%, they eat snakes. Sometimes, end of last year, I saw one that had held a snake for a very, very long time. And the only thing, Ian, what, what, what it wasn't able to do, unlike snake eagles, Ian, I think it's rather difficult for them to kill it because it held that snake for a whole 20 minutes before it swallowed it. It tried to kill it, it couldn't. And unlike other birds that would just, you know, swallow, I would say, snakes wholly. I'm talking about, um, let me see, are the secretary birds, uh, herons that will always cut snakes, uh, snake eagles, or martial eagles, for example, cut snakes and solve them still alive. I think it's a challenge for these birds just to uh, eat them or swallow them when they are still alive. They need to kill them. Very good. And I hear more good news of uh, spotted cats in South Africa. James, who do you got? Hello, everybody. There is the spotted cat. And, well, let's see if James Richard can identify, or any of you can identify this cat from there. <laughs> I know who it is because I've seen her face. But it'd be... <laughs> I bet... I bet there are a few of you who could actually identify this cat from just what you're seeing there. 
Now, we are surrounded by impala here on both sides of this cat. And I believe the Tingana is heading straight towards this area. So I'm not going to move just because you can see she does seem to be, well, yes, was stalking. I'm just going to go back a bit. There we go. Guys, I think you should have a sit. Left. No, no, she's there. Left a bit. Yeah, she's in that gap. Up, 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 up. There. I've seen her now. Um, all of you saying, hooray, yes, Tandy. Indeed it is Tandy. Well done. You know, we should get a view of her face, actually. Sorry, everybody. Quite thick in here. And I must tell you, the game drive radio has been a level of, well, a level of professional that would make... I'm trying to think of something deeply unprofessional. A riot. Basically, it's like a, a riot. Okay, the cat is just over there, walking now straight towards Tingana. There she is. Can you see her there? Yeah. You can hear the impalas are very much the wiser of her presence now. fully aware of her. I'm just going to let the other vehicles stop moving around first and then we'll carry on. Quite possibly Tlalamba also in this area. I've heard Aubrey say, yeah, they've got Tlalamba there now as well. Let's go. Yeah, look to the left. Tingana is now running this way. Just to the left here, another leopard went running. Just in there. There, there, there. Not there. Okay, let's carry on with Tandi. Tlalamba is to the right. <laughs> She's up in front of us. Sorry, we've lost some our aerials disintegrated. Sorry about that, everybody. Our aerial has detached itself. Ah, a piece broke off. Right, okay, never mind, we're okay. Tan Tandy's gone off there, Tlalamba is there. We will get the camera onto the cat as soon as Sebastian has reattached the aerial. There he has. She's on the tree there, can you see, Seb? Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Hello, kitty. Now, she's, Tlalamba apparently is just to the right of where she's looking. And Tingana's heading this way, so I'm going to move now. Let's get into a better position. Trist is coming this way. Let's go back to him now with Tingana. We are indeed. So we're not very far at all. Tingana's here on my right-hand side. And just straight through the bush, I can see where James and the rest of the guys are. They're a little bit kind of south of where Tingana's facing at the moment. But given that Kalamba's here, Tandi's here, he might bump into one of them. And he has kind of followed his nose and run all the way to this area and has kind of in the mix as well. So we've got three leopards in the space of a very, very short distance, which is absolutely amazing. It's been a long time since we've had a trifecta of leopards together and it's super exciting when we get to see them all and I want to see what the reaction is of Tandi and Tingana to Tlalamba and whether or not she is going to be all right. Right, now I believe James is with Tandi so let's quickly send you across to them. Look, 
We've got both of them here. They're having a bit of a fight. Tundi is salivating and actually being less of the aggressor. Fascinating. So you saw that little hit there. This little Tlalamba heading towards us now, and she was the one being aggressive. Now Tingana's running towards us, and that's because of the sound that, no doubt, they were making. Tingana's coming right here. I'm going to wait where we are, because we've got Tlalamba now, just three meters from us. Let's quickly go to an unscheduled fast as possible. Hello everybody, welcome to the western fringes of the great Kruger National Park. My name is James Hendry, we've got Sebastian on camera and we have got three leopards in the offing here. Two of them in front of us. This is little Tlalamba. She's aged 18 months and just behind her, her mother Tandi. And they're in a slightly sort of aggressive state because they are separating from each other. Tlalamba is becoming independent. But to throw more into the mix, the father of this young cat is on her way in here. The Duke of Juma, Tingana. So there's a frantic sighting going on here. It is very, very special indeed. The sound you can hear in the background... Well, it's the sound of Impala alarm calling. Now, Tandi is basically starting to try and make Tlalamba move away and become independent. And we think she may well be pregnant. Now, those other sounds you can hear are human beings obviously talking, they're guests in the sighting. Here comes the mother now. I'm just going to get out of the way. Mum is growling. You can hear her going. The hissing is the daughter, the growling is the mother. That's the daughter you're looking at there, Tlalamba. Now we've got the father coming in from the right-hand side of your picture. I haven't seen him yet, but he'll have been attracted by the sound of this fight and what's interesting is that we think Tandi the mother is flicking her tail like that is in fact pregnant again possibly with another of Tingana's offspring well Maya good question from you there is it okay for us to be so close you know it is because we know these cats well but also they have approached us now she's chuffing so that's called chuffing you see that that's a kind of, it's a very friendly greeting. It's a non-aggressive greeting. And I think she's looking at her father. I don't think, there, there, there's the father to the right-hand side. There we go. There's Tingana. He's coming now. He's smelling where Tandi was marking her territory. Now we're going to get all three of them in one picture. That is fantastic. That is not something you see every day. Isn't this magical? So we've got the, the big old Duke Tingana, age 13 odd, and his daughter's approaching him. Look at that. That is just beyond magical. There's been physical contact, and watch, she's chuffing all the time at him. Chuff, chuff, chuff. There, you can see the little movement in her face. Chuff, chuff, chuff. Just saying to her dad, hi dad, oh, I don't mean any harm, it's lovely to see you. And now she's chuffing at her mother is moving slightly away towards the right-hand side. He's also growling. I'm just going to move forward slightly, everyone. It's just the most magical sighting. I'm going to stop there. There we've got her daughter approaching father again. Tandi is just off to the right-hand side. She's sort of slowly moving away now. But what's amazing about this is that you don't read it in the textbooks. You don't read about especially daughters having contact with their fathers like this, especially when they're as old as she is. 
I'm sure it does happen, but we don't see it often. This is so special, and especially that there was physical contact. Holly, you say this is amazing. Yes, it absolutely is quite stunning. Now, daughter's running after mum. I'm going to move again once Tingana's finished his film and grimace. Yeah. Now, oh, little Talamba's running after her mother. Oops, the daisies. We're parked on a small stump. Let's try and get out of here. Isn't this amazing? Now, we've got another vehicle in the sighting or standing by there. It's Tristan. And we're going to go across to Tristan now. He's got Tingana, and we're going to try and fire, follow Tandi and Tlalamba. Indeed, so we were on the trail of Tingana all afternoon and he eventually joined with James, with Tandi and Kalamba. What an incredible way to spend an afternoon. So you can see Tingana's busy sniffing around. It's tricky at the moment because Tandi and Kalamba are running one way, Tingana's going the other way and there's just kind of, you know, movement all over the place at this stage. And what he's basically doing at the moment is he's just sniffing around, trying to figure out exactly who is who and what is going on. I'm pretty sure he is confronted with so much estrogen at once that he's probably a little bit confused as to what's happening. But once they've chuffed and they've smelt, he'll be easily be able to work out who they are. He will know the scent for both of these leopards very, very well. So, Linda, whether or not he knows it's his daughter is obviously debatable. He, essentially, yes. Um, and the reason why is because all the time that she's been alive, she leaves a chemical signature behind, um, which essentially will basically, Stingana will know that signature, and he's bumped into her periodically through her life. Um, and so she's kind of got, he's gotten used to that smell and knows that that's not a threat to him, and as, as a female as well, it's not going to be a threat to his territory later. So he's quite fine with her. He knows that scent very, very well. And on top of that, then you've got, you know, the fact that he knows Tandy's scent too. I'm going to just try and reposition slightly I'm trying to see where he's going. The problem that you have with leopards like this is that they often will try and move around. Now he's just through this gap, so it shouldn't take us too long to get a view of him. We just need to kind of turn through this area here. Now, hold on, Sens. Let me just go straight this way. Listen, listen, listen. So that was him telling everybody I'm the boss here. He's telling Tandy, he's telling Klalamba, um, this is my area. And that sawing is to tell that he is the dominant male and in charge of what's going on here. Look at that. Now, to get three leopards in a single sighting is just ridiculous. Now, Tingana looks like he's going to follow in behind Tandy and Klalamba. And it sounds like James is still with Klalamba and she's chuffing away at Tandy. So we've still got Tlalamba here. She has moved away from Tingana and she's now between Tandi and Tingana. Tandi's moved off to the left-hand side of your picture there. And it's almost like she's trying to placate her parents and bring them back together. She's looking towards Tandi, now she's calling Tandi. She was doing that straight towards Tingana as well. You've just heard sawing. And I know there is a lot of sound around, but it's just because there are many excited viewers and guests from the lodges. towards her dad. I can't see Tandy anywhere. Yeah, Chris, you say she sounds like a frog. She sounds a little bit like a frog that's eaten something she shouldn't have and is about to try and oops it up. I can't 
don't see uh, either of the other two. I've only got Clalumba here. I'm just indicating to Aubrey where they've gone. All right, let's... I'm going to wait here. I don't want to move just yet because it's quite difficult to figure out exactly what's going on. So there goes Lalama back towards her mum. But isn't it interesting that she's following her mum, who showed her nothing but displeasure and aggression with those growls and salivating and then marking and scraping. And her father showed none of the same. In fact, I've never seen her dad not growl at her when he's been close by. It's the first time I've seen him react like that. Okay, I think we should move on. Let's see if we can catch up. Huh. Absolutely fantastic stuff. We are, of course, in the Western Kruger and the Sabi Sands, and that is the area most world-renowned for great leopard sightings. The little ones lie they're down. Both there. They're both there. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. well done. Okay, so Sebastian says that they are both there. Yes, we can see them both. Say when, yeah. Seb. A little bit more. There we go. There you can see them both. Sorry about the trees and bushes. So that's Mum looking at us. Can you hold this one, James? That's the one. I'm just going to move this bush out of the way. Thank you. Yeah, it's very interesting. A lot of you who've been watching for a long time noticing that Tandy's belly looks smaller than it has before. And we all thought she might well be pregnant, but many of you saying that her belly looks a bit smaller. Yeah, I have to agree. So that's Tandy on the left and Tlalamba on the right. number of you wondering if she has a den around here, maybe she's given birth. Well, that's possible. Certainly possible. We'd be around about the time. But we'd expect, yeah, we probably wouldn't see necessarily that she's lactating. It, it's early. It's early for her to have another cup if she does have one. There's Tingana. He's marking his territory with a sawing call as the sun sets. Tandy's just moved off to the left. Absolutely fascinating. All right, let's go back to Tingana with Tristan. still sitting in where they originally met and he's looking in all the trees very hopeful that he's going to find himself a little meal that maybe Tandy or Tlalamba might have had but I think he's going to be disappointed I think this was just a circumstance thing that they all came together but he's let out a few sores once again and it looks like he might go following the two girls to go and see what they get up to and figure out what's going on but what an incredible sighting to see three leopards in the same spot is really something you don't see every day and we've been absolutely spoiled by the fact that we had them now I'm gonna try and see if I can follow him it's gonna require a little bit of kind of maneuvering and a bit of work to get through a thicket and I just hope I don't impale myself as we do this so, so lots and lots of stumps in this area so one needs to be a little bit careful about the way that we do it but pretty sure he's going to follow the ladies and i wouldn't be surprised they all end up at a big pan that's close by um, for a drink of water in the afternoon i think everybody's realized that they're not a threat to one another that's why we're not seeing too much aggression from Tingana. He's most certainly kind of relaxed quite a bit um, since he first arrived. I think when he first heard all those shouting impalas and probably heard the chuffing of leopards, he probably thought to himself, well, there might be an intruder or something like that. And so that's why he's run in the way he did. And now he's kind of figured everybody out. I think he's gonna calm down a bit. Um, we've got to try to get around this little thicket and then we should be able to get one last view of him um, as he gets through this 
dense area. It really isn't easy negotiating some of these sections. So James is just here in front of me and Tingana should be coming out somewhere on our right hand side. Since you see him, there he is, there he is on the termite mount. I'm just gonna try and see if I can get us one last sort of view. He's lying down now on the mound and I think he's happy to sit there. I'm just gonna make sure I don't, like I say, decapitate myself or Senzo as we make our way through this. But there he is, looking as regal as one could ever imagine. Look at that, isn't that special? Oh, it is always so nice to see leopards and particularly so many together. Right, well, it can't get any better than that. But now that things have sort of calmed down, we're going to say goodbye to all of you. Hope that you absolutely enjoyed that. It really is special to see three leopards together. And if you want to know what carries on to happening, remember you can just Google Safari Live and we'll continue to watch them over the course of the next few hours this evening. But until then, until we see you guys again next time, it's been an absolute pleasure. Bye for now. Well, that was chaotic in many ways. <laughs> it's been one of those afternoons. It's been a crazy, crazy afternoon. It was bound to happen that we were going to get an interaction between Tingana, Tandi, Tlalamba at some point. It had to kind of go uh, the way it is. And I believe the guys are telling me, I, haven't, I mean, I only saw a brief glimpse of Tandi just now as she walked, but the guys are telling me that um, she looks like she's very empty and that her milk pouches are quite full. So I wonder if maybe she hasn't given birth somewhere around here. Um, it will be very, very intriguing if she has. There goes Tingana. He's going to go and follow where Tandi and Klalamba are they obviously on the other side um, and Tingana is going to head off towards where sort of James is at the moment and we'll have to try and kind of figure a way to just stand back and the reason why we kind of stand quite close is because obviously if they split apart we want to be able to follow each one of them and so you know we'll let the other vehicles view them and then we'll kind of just separate and, and try and figure out what's going on but in the meantime while I sit here and see what happens um, Tingana is going straight towards James's vehicle at the moment so let's send you across to him. We can see that her milk pouches do look full. Tandi there looks to me very empty and it's difficult to tell if she is lactating or not from here. She's just smelling where Tlalamba's been. Yeah, 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 look, look, right next to us here, yeah? we've got Tingana and Tlalamba. That's Tingana, there's Tlalamba. She's still chuffing away. This is unbelievable. We've got three leopards within three meters of the sky. Oh dear, that's Tandy now shouting at Tingana. She doesn't want him near. That would be expected if she's got baby cubs. He's not interested in causing trouble. That's his territorial call. He might just be able to hear the chuffing. straight in front of us. There she sits, chuffing away. Chuff, 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 chuff. Tandy growling. Still making a little frog sound. Tingana off to the left. There we go. So he's very interested, of course, in what's going on here. Father of the new cubs, I don't think he'd pose them any threat. But any mother leopard with 
any other predator, including related predators, near her new cubs will be extremely threatened and therefore potentially dangerous. She's hissing at Tingana. Tingana's just standing beyond her. Looking as though butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. Oh, no, he's going to do what he does best, which is sleep. He'll also be rolling to leave the scent there. I can just see Columba through the bushes in front of us, so all three still here. smell where Tandy's been and where Tlalamba's been. saying that these are the most amazing sounds. They are, and all three of them making different sounds, aren't they? Tingana with his sawing, Tundi with her growling, and Tlalamba with her hissing and chuffing. I'm just going to call Tristan and tell him to go around the other side, because I think he'll get... Just wait and see if that other vehicle doesn't go away. That light you can see is not the light of heaven, but in fact a spotlight from one of the other vehicles. Just absolute magic. He's had enough. He's seen enough of his daughter and his consort, checked them out, seen that they're okay. Let's see if he moves off. No, no. I'm just <laughs> Tristan just saying that he's struggling to hear what's going on because of the radio. Right, so that's Tandy. Tingana's moved off. Tristan will probably try and follow up on him, and we'll stay with these two.
course, if either of them move from here to get over this rather substantial amount of log. Yes, many of you are feeling a bit sorry for Tundi if she does have cubs, and this must be quite distressing for her. Uh, you know what? It's very difficult for a leopard to ask somebody to go away quietly. You know, you might, if you had a baby and you wanted your friends to go home, you might say, oh, would you please, you know, just kind of go home, I'm trying to be a mother. Lip doesn't have that, it's kind of got a, um, I nearly said a bad word there. It's kind of got a response that says, get out of here or I'll kill you, or it doesn't say anything at all. So, yes, obviously there are signs of distress here, but Tingana's moved off, I don't think he poses a threat at all. She's irritated with Tlalamba because it feels odd to have one cub with the other. And I wonder if any of you can remember how quickly she became pregnant when Tamba, who was her offspring before Tlalamba, was, um, or how old he was when she was pregnant with Tlalamba. And I think, I'm guessing here, I think he was 15 months or so, so maybe about three months older than Tlalamba. I'm sure many of you will be able to remember that, but I think that's what the story was. So, yes, I do think she's showing signs of distress, but I don't actually think there's a huge danger here. Alrighty, let's go across to the Vov, where I think there's probably a slightly calmer scene in the Masai Mara. Well, indeed, James, it is, uh, well, more peaceful, I suppose, but we've had lots of movement. Uh, all of the lionesses eventually stood up. Uh, oh, that one's a little cub's about to jump and catch her sibling. They all stood up, one by one came to this ginormous fig tree, did a scratch. Each one of them investigated the males. The cubs got right up close and personal with the males, and the males got very grumpy. The blonde male, he moved right away, and the other blonde male then got caught by all three cubs, and eventually he decided he's had enough playing. The little contact calls. They've been making some phenomenal sounds. It's quite amazing seeing the cubs go and just start jumping on the males. One male, as I said, got a bit grumpy and moved off, but there was no negative behavior. The other male then became a jungle gym, and he got a bit annoyed, but he didn't show... There's another boy. He didn't become aggressive or anything. He just decided, children, I don't look after children. And he stood up and walked to go stand in a corner with his brother, or his coalition mate anyway. And they're off to our right, and the long grass gone back to sleep. They're going to stay here, watch. Here it comes, three. Stalk is on. Here we go, the other one. There's no idea what's about to happen. <laughs> Lost a little bit of his impetus there. How incredible to see the Juma family coming together like that. So interesting. James has been recording some phenomenal stuff here, so don't worry, there will be a highlights package, no doubt. When it happens, it all happens at the same time. This little marvels how Tingana and Tlalamba can hang out like that. It really, really does interest me. But then also seeing these three cubs jumping on those two adult males was also quite something. You're risking a lot going and messing with a big adult. Go back to the tree. And this tree is signposted by each lioness. Each lioness has scratched herself onto the tree. Oopsie, here he comes. <laughs> Everyone's commenting on how cute they are. They are very cute. Very, very cute. And thankfully they've come back towards the road where we originally found. Oopsie, there we go, up they go. Here comes mum to put a bit of discipline in. <laughs> she 
He just pulled him out the tree. <laughs> Down. You're not a leopard. You're a lion. We live on the ground. <laughs> oh, here we go. Wonderful contact calling going on. And thankfully, as I said, they've come back to the road. And where we were in there it was a very bumpy, lots of rocks. But which way are they going to move? The wind is coming now from directly in front of us. Sort of coming from the, uh, the east. That's a good way to go, because that direction we've definitely got signal. No, don't look that way. Very, very special scenes we're experiencing here, everybody. I hope you're enjoying them with us as well. It's, not, it's been a while since I've managed to spend time with a few lion cubs behaving as they do. And um, here we go, she's going to walk right past us. Each of the lionesses, in turn, has stood up in front of us and defecated and thankfully the wind hasn't blown it in our direction which has been very very great but anyway we're going to stay here with this pride of lions and while we do that let's go back down and see how the leopard drama unfolds in Juma. right we've got more conflagration going on here tundi is growling Lalamba is hissing that's Tundi we're looking at. You can see that from her mangled ear. The lump is just to the left-hand side, but behind some bushes, so we can't see what's going on. But she's now hissing loudly. Thankfully, the vehicles have moved off. Well, all but one. up towards the vehicle um, that is in the sighting. There is not one person on it looking at the leopards. They are all looking at their cell phones. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven people looking at their phones. Unbelievable. Kirsten saying maybe they're watching Safari Live. Maybe they are. Maybe we've just got a better view. <laughs> That's probably exactly what's going on. live, the growling most certainly did attract another predator in the form of Tingana. So yes, absolutely. Would it attract hyenas? No, very unlikely, because they know that this is a fight. It's unlikely to be a food. They might come and investigate. Uh, lions, yep, yeah, lions would come and look what was going on here. of what's going on here is quite difficult because Tlalamba is behaving in a slightly aggressive fashion and I wonder if she isn't experiencing a kind of feeling of you know, I should be sort of territorial now and 
maybe this old duck needs to move away and why is she around here? And of course the old duck is thinking to herself, how dare you be in this area? Go and find yourself somewhere else to live. I think I might be quite wrong here, but we're going to see Tlalamba wedge in between Shidulu to the west and Tandi over here. And I think Tandi is going to start spending more and more time towards the east. That's a guess. I could be quite wrong. But it would be pretty much how the territories were if that was to happen. Basically, Tlalamba would take Karula's old territory. But really a bit smaller, in fact, quite substantially smaller. Chasing and snarling and anger and viciousness. Of course, we start our TV show in about half an hour, by which time both of these cats would have disappeared or gone to sleep, which is unfortunate. Same with Tangana's, at least with Tristan's. Tangana will probably have crossed south out of the boundary. And we'll look at a couple of chameleons and maybe if we're lucky a pea spider there are some hyenas calling in the background but not because of this they're a long way away Kirsten who's directing the show this evening says she's hoping for a scrub hair on TV I don't think that we should get our hopes up too high Kirsten let's just keep them under control Actually, we were lucky today because there is a lot of bush around here, as you've seen. And when that first meeting took place, we just happened by blind luck to be in the right place. Nobody else had the view that we did. I'm tired now, is Tundi? Light has now faded completely. Alrighty. Oh dear, let's go back across to Tristan <laughs> and let him update you as to whether or not Chingana is going to leave. Well, as you can see, Tingana is just in front of us, um, walking straight towards us at the moment. So he's going straight south. I'm going to have to start and just move back with him, otherwise I'm going to block his road. Uh, we don't want to block the Duke's road, but he is heading pretty much straight to the southern boundary, and I'm almost 90% sure he will not be here for the start of this TV show. Pretty sure we're going to follow him all the way. Um, <coughs> down to the boundary. I mean, he's probably, at the rate he's walking, 10 minutes from crossing over. I'm just hoping he gets to Twin Dams, has a drink and flops down and that's the end of it. But it doesn't look like that's going to be the case. It looks like he's on a mission now. Now he's been spurred on by the fact that he's got two girls to protect and so he's kind of just making sure that he patrols his territory and marks. See, sorry, Sens. One should not watch the leopard and should actually watch where we're reversing when doing this otherwise we're going to get ourselves into trouble hopefully like i say he slows down a little bit but at this stage it's not looking good for <laughs> tingana to still be around in, in half an hour's time just trying to give us some decent amount of space for the show to close so we're going to try and do a good sort of 100 meters and see if we time this perfectly for the end of our afternoon. So here we go, we're gonna stop here. This should be it. What do you reckon, Sans? You think I've gone 90 seconds? I think we're too, too close for 90 seconds, but let's try, let's see how we go. Hopefully he'll stop at some point and kind of settle down on the road, but it looks like he's coming straight towards us. Oh, there we go. Thanks, Tingy. You've done me a solid there because I think otherwise he would have come past us too quickly and we would have uh, not got this right at all, but um, 
What an epic afternoon it's been. Whew. Leopards all over the place. No, don't go that way now. No, now you're going the wrong way. You were supposed to walk straight at us. Then we would have had a really nice walk by. Anyway, he's probably going to send Mark and then hopefully turn towards us. Yeah, there we go. Now he's going to come behind a car and then come in our direction. Unfortunately, though, it is that time where we do need to say goodbye to all of you. Um, I'm sorry that you, we're not giving you a nice frame here because the car is way too close where he's rubbing his face in dung at the moment. So I do apologize about that. Sends me go for a little bit for you. But it has been an epic afternoon. Hopefully you've all enjoyed it um, and have had a good time. So from all of us, it's been an absolute pleasure. Hopefully we'll see you in half an hour for our TV show and again tomorrow morning for the Sunrise Safari. Mm -hmm.